The scary stories will start in 30 seconds. Before they do, I just want to remind you to subscribe to my channel. I promise there will always be minimal ads in my videos. And in this video, there's only three mid-roll ads. That way you can enjoy the stories without being interrupted constantly. So again, if you enjoy my videos, please subscribe and hit the thumbs up. It helps me more than you know. Now, let's begin. When I was growing up, I lived in rural Alabama, about 30 miles north of a place called Mount Pinson. There really wasn't anything around, just houses. Nothing like a neighborhood in the traditional sense. No stores, nothing. We had one police officer, and he was pretty friendly. He was my best friend's uncle. He would often let us ride around with him because nothing really ever happened. There wasn't a recorded murder or anything beyond someone being drunk and a public nuisance. He didn't even arrest people for that. He would just ferry them home. We had this lady who was all alone. Her husband had died a few years earlier, and she was very lonely. She called this one cop over everything. If some kids were in her yard playing, she would call this cop, saying she was being harassed. She did it because she was lonely and just wanted the company. No one could figure out why she wasn't just nicer to the kids or anyone around the neighborhood. One day there was this new kid kicking around near this little spot that we liked to hang out. It had a nice climbing tree and a rope swing. My friend and I, being interested in this kid, introduced ourselves. He told us stories of living in a big city and how fun it was. We were mesmerized at the time. He taught us some new games to play. We generally had a good time. Unfortunately, his father was a real jerk. It turned out this kid was the mean old lady's grandson, and his father had lost his job and went back to stay with his mom while he recuperated. Since the kid was around, she had warmed up a little to us and would invite us over for snacks and stuff. We obliged being kids because we were always down for some free treats. One day, the new kid never showed up to our little spot again. We figured he was busy with his grandma and was just doing other things. A couple of days went by and my friend told his uncle. His uncle said that he would take a look. He let us tag along because he never imagined anything weird happening. It took about 10 minutes to make it up the windy dirt road to her house. It was quicker just to walk through the field. It took maybe two minutes to do. Well, we got up there and he instructed us to stay by the car and we obliged. He knocks and knocks. No answer. Their car is there. He knocked again, this time louder. No answer. So he circled around to look in the back. My friend and I decided to try knocking ourselves. It didn't seem like a bad idea at the time. We went up to the door and knocked. Nothing. My friend grabbed the doorknob and turned it, and I asked him what he was doing, and he pushed the door open. We both almost threw up instantly. It was like the smell was a physical force and pushed up against us. It was so vile, you can't even imagine. My friend's uncle made his way around and when he got to the porch, by the smell, he knew immediately what had happened. He instructed us to go to the car and wait. He went inside to look around and then came bolting out of the house and threw up on the grass. He had tears in his eyes. Not like he was crying, but because he had just seen something that nobody is supposed to see. He went to his car to contact someone. My friend took off and I went after him. He was intrigued, and so was I. I felt a little more bolder following him in. We tiptoed inside, and the first room was completely clean. Nothing to see. But then, we walked into the kitchen. 
and saw that the kid was stuffed into the oven, burnt. He had clawed at the glass front of the door and actually scratched it. You could see his hands, his face. It looked like he was still alive trying to get out. My friend and I just sat there in complete shock for what seemed like eternity. It was so surreal. My friend's uncle snapped us back to reality as he came running in the house and grabbed us, screaming, yelling, telling us never to disobey him again. He took us both outside, and we just sat there. The entire evening we didn't say a word to each other or anyone. My friend's uncle dropped me off later. I never saw my friend again. The uncle said that he couldn't handle it and went to live with some family members in the city. My family moved a year later. I've never been near that house again. The uncle ended up drinking himself to death because of depression. A farm that was near that house ended up having some sort of infestation and they lost all of their crops. This weird circle of death seemed to expand around that house. When I was growing up, my little brother, who was three at the time, used to sleepwalk through our house at night. He would walk down to the basement where I slept and crack open my door between 11 and 2 a.m. He would then slowly push it open and shuffle inside. When I would ask what he was doing, he would always stare at the floor and say, Where's mom? I would tell him that she was upstairs, and he would repeat, Where's mom? Each night I would take him back upstairs and lead him back to bed where he would fall asleep. One night, at about 1 a.m., I awoke to hear crying at the bottom of the stairs. I walked out to investigate, and he was sitting on the bottom step. I asked him what was wrong, and again he said, Where's mom? I told him she was upstairs, and we should go get her. No, he said, staring at the floor. There's a bloody head following me. What? I asked. He looked up from the floor, stared me right in the eyes, opened his mouth, and let out the shrillest blood-curdling scream I have ever heard in my life. It scared the living hell out of me. It was so loud that the whole family got out of their beds to see what was going on. After that, I had never asked him what he was doing downstairs. I would just take him immediately back to his room. This happened in 1996. I was in my mid-twenties. For quick background and setting, I am a female and I was living with my parents at the time. This was prior to smartphones, and I did not have a cell phone of my own. My parents' home was on a residential street in New York State. Blue-collar neighborhood, commuting distance to New York City. We lived down the street from an industrial area. A few old factory buildings that blended in with the houses, and ultimately led to the town park and swimming pool, with the town dump beyond that. A strange mix of comforting suburbia and desolation. If you left my front door, went left down the block, and then hung a left at the first corner, you would be at the small gated entrance to the high school football field. The field was completely surrounded by a very tall chain-link fence with a few gated entrances. This small entrance was the only way to get into the field unless there was an event happening. The field was adjacent to the first of the factory building parking lots. I felt very lucky to be so close to the field, because it had a track around it. The track ran directly around the field, and separated it from the two large sets of bleachers. This was an old stadium, even in the 90s, and while the home bleachers had been updated to metal years before, the visitor bleachers nearest the entrance were still wood. The track was dirt. It was softer on the knees than concrete, 
so I liked to nip down there in the morning before heading to my train and do a quick two or three mile run for exercise. I usually had the track to myself in the mornings. Of course, lots of days I didn't make the morning run, so if I got home before sundown, I would head down and run in the evening. The evenings were different, usually more populated. This particular evening, I was really pushing the daylight, but I wanted the exercise. It was summer, so I want to say it was around 7.30 or 8, but getting more toward dusk. There are the usual neighborhood guys playing soccer on the field and three other folks on the track walking or running. A middle-aged man, an older woman, and a woman a little older than me in a pink running suit, or maybe just pink sweats and hoodie. I was feeling annoyed because it had rained and the track was not in great shape, so there were still muddy patches and uneven parts. It was hard to keep your pace when you had to dodge them along with watching for other people. I was wondering if the other people on the track had been there a while. Maybe they would finish up, so I could have the track to myself? That would be perfect. I was getting into it, listening to my music, and after three or four laps I looked around to see that the older woman and the middle-aged man were gone. Yes, just the soccer guys and the pink lady now. I was doing my best to keep away from her on the track. The soccer guys started to gather up their stuff and walk off the field toward the gate, at the corner by the old bleachers, dispersing back to their homes. It's just me and her now. I glanced back over my shoulder to see where she was. She was closer to me than I had thought she should be, so I picked up the pace. She can't have much longer. Maybe I'll get my last mile in, in peace, I think. Then... I see she is gaining on me. She's picking up her pace, and I notice she is looking at me. She's looking at me, expectantly, like she wants something from me. Do I know her? I really don't want to get into a conversation right now. I go a little faster as I'm passing the home side bleachers. She breaks into a full-on sprint and is suddenly on my left reaching out to grab my arm. I'm startled. We both stop in our tracks, and I pull off my headphones. She leans in close, and says low and slow, I was going to leave earlier, but you were still here, and I didn't want to leave you alone. Oh, great. I back up and start to cut her off, and tell her that I'm fine, no problem. But then, she says it. There's a man under the bleachers. At that point I looked past her across the field, and I see him, sitting under the old wooden bleachers all the way at the back, against the cement wall, kind of blending in. I can make out the grayish hair, beard, and white tank top. He's just sitting there on something. A bucket, maybe? Watching. I can't stay any later. She said quietly, I have to go. Be careful. She starts to walk away. Thanks, I said. I'll walk out with you. Because I have nothing to prove, and I'm going to cut my run short tonight. As we headed out of the gate, keeping an eye on the bleachers, she said something that stuck with me. She looked up at the tall fence around the narrow opening and said, one way in, one way out. She got in her car, we waved, and I headed down the block to my house as she drove off. I told my mom about it, and we decided he may have just been a homeless man sheltering under there. I would still use the track while I lived there, but only if there were other people. I always looked under the bleachers. I never saw the man again, and I never saw the pink lady again, either. I did see the soccer guys and the older woman and middle-aged man, and lots of other folks, but not her. When I think back on it, it still freaks me out that I ran past him several times that night and did not notice him. And I wouldn't have noticed him if it wasn't for that nice woman. She purposely stayed with me and made me painfully aware 
of how often I was running in what amounted to a cage with just one way in and one way out. My grandparents lived on a farm in the middle of Nebraska. They had just gotten married, moved in together, and had their first baby. The baby was only a few months old and needed to be watched, but it was early morning and the cows had to be milked. My grandfather couldn't have done the work alone. He needed my grandmother to help. The labor was easy and only took a short while to be finished, and the baby, my aunt, had been fed a while ago and was sleeping soundly. So my grandfather and my grandmother both went to the barn to milk the cows, leaving my aunt asleep. They finished milking the cows and my grandmother heads back to the house while my grandfather stays in the barn to continue working. But when she approaches the house, my grandmother notices the door is ajar and swinging gently in the wind. She figures it is probably nothing but is nervous just the same. She calls for my grandfather, who reluctantly comes to soothe her nerves. They enter the house together and hear the sound of the toilet flush just ending. It was strange, but farmhouses in this area at this time had rather shoddy plumbing. So while they become more nervous, they remained calm. They then picked up their paces and headed towards the cradle where my aunt was screaming. The light hanging down from the ceiling is swinging violently as if it was just thrown on. My grandmother goes to pick up my aunt and notices a black hair on her white gown. Both of my grandparents had white blonde hair and there is no one around and there is no reasonable explanation for this hair being there. My grandmother becomes hysterical when my grandfather notices the latch to the attic is swinging as though someone had just crawled up inside of it. He goes towards it, readying himself to open it. My grandmother lunges at him and convinces him in between her sobs to leave instead. They jump in the truck and drive to town. They never found out if anyone was in the house or not. However, a week later, Charlie Starkweather was found less than 30 miles away from their home. He was, I believe, the largest serial killer in America for a short time when these events transpired. My family used to rent a house in town along with my aunt and uncle when I was very young that we eventually moved out because of very strange things that happened while we lived there. But the most memorable and final straw was the night that my aunt was using the toilet and just happened to look down at this small hole in the floor that had been there since we moved in. And she saw a man standing in the basement, looking right back up at her, smiling. My aunt ran out of the bathroom and screamed for my uncle. After explaining to him that there was a man in the basement, my uncle went and got my dad, and they both went down the basement stairs, where they found nothing but footprints in the dirty floor where someone had been standing and moving around, directly underneath the hole. I was super excited to get my first apartment. It was in an old antebellum house that was split into four units. A very cool place to live. However, every time I was taking a shower, I would get this overwhelmingly creepy feeling, like somebody was watching me. Then the dream started. I kept dreaming about this old lady in a pink nightgown. Sometimes she just looked frail and sweet, and she would say that I should go with her, she never said where we would go. Other times, the dreams were terrifying. Her eye sockets were empty. Her hair was greasy, stringy, and falling out. Her mouth was twisted in a tormented scream, and she would frantically claw the air, trying to grab me. 
The longer that I lived there, the more menacing the dreams got. Also, the feeling of unease and the feeling of being watched in the shower increased dramatically. By the time we moved out, I couldn't close my eyes in the shower. It sounds silly, but I had this overwhelming feeling that I was going to die if I had my eyes closed for too long. After moving out, I discussed all these weird feelings with a friend of mine who had recently moved into a house across the street from the old apartment. I was trying to laugh it off. He said that another friend of his used to live in the apartment above mine several years ago. An old lady died in what used to be my apartment. Nobody else wanted to live in that unit for more than a couple of months at a time. The building recently burned down. The fire started in my old apartment. They still don't know what started the fire. It still creeps me out when I think about it. I remember when I was a kid. One night I woke up in the middle of the night to get a drink of water. I went downstairs to the kitchen and was surprised to see my little brother standing at the back sliding glass door. I stepped out of the kitchen to see what he was doing and found that the sliding door was open and my little brother was talking to what I assumed was himself. As I approached him, I heard him say, I said no, you can't come in here. Obviously this was surprising and since I couldn't see well in the dark, I asked who he was talking to. He turned to me with his eyes half open and said, The man outside. I turned and looked out into the darkness, but I couldn't see anyone. I closed the door and put my little brother to bed and spent the rest of the night confused and scared beyond belief. The next morning my little brother had no idea what I was talking about when I brought it up. When I was a kid, I used to ride my bike almost daily to the local library branch a few blocks from my home. One day when I was about eight, I rode down to the library like I normally did, parked my bike by the bike rack near the back entrance to the building went in and browsed for whatever an eight-year-old boy would read, checked out a few books, and left the library. When I came out, there was a man standing over by the bike rack. I didn't think anything of it, so I just went over to get my bike so I could go home. As I went to get on my bike, he said, Hi, my name is John. Then he asked me, What's your name? I was a stupid kid, so I told him, and then he said, I work with your mom, you know. What is her name again? So again, stupid kid, I told him, and then he said, Well, she wanted me to show you something over there behind those trees. In hindsight, and upon many years of reflection upon this incident, the guy sounds like the most inept kidnapper in history. It's like he was reading from the script of how not to abduct a child. However, it was 35 years ago, and the most education kids got about this kind of thing was just don't talk to strangers. My parents were great, but this was just not something people worried about all that much back then. I was a bit creeped out when he said that my mom wanted him to show me something in the trees, and my radar for this is weird went up. I politely declined the invitation to the woods and hopped on my bike to pedal home. As I turned away, he grabbed the bar on the rear of my seat to keep me from pedaling away. Now I was scared. I jumped off the back and re-entered the library. I made my way to the circulation desk and asked if I could use the phone. The woman at the desk told me that the phone was not for public use, so I left the library again from the back entrance. The front was always locked. Happily, my bike was still there, and the creepy man was gone. Thinking nothing of it, I jumped on my bike and set off. About a block from the library, 
I noticed a brown car at a stop sign on a side street. I looked again, and I saw the creep behind the wheel. I realized many years later, and not at this time, that he knew my route home, which means he must have followed me from my house to the library. Whenever I think of this now, it gives me a sick feeling knowing that he could have taken me any time he wanted on my way to the library. I was probably saved by something as random as someone walking a dog or grabbing their mail, and he didn't want any witnesses. I pedaled faster once I spotted him, and he pulled out onto the main road. I was on the sidewalk, and he was following me closely. When my bike sped up, he sped up, all the while screaming and pointing at me. By now, I was screaming too, and moving pretty quickly for an eight-year-old on a five-speed carrying library books, and no, I never thought to drop the books. I quickly turned onto a side street, and he was moving too fast to make the turn as well, and I saw him turn onto the next side street. The side street I turned on led to my street, but there was a hill that I could not pedal up between my street and I. I got about midway up the hill when I had to get off and walk my bike up. He was parked at the very top of the hill, just staring at me. I literally walked right past him, and I will never forget his stare or the hate in his eyes. I have no idea why he let me walk past him, why he didn't grab me, why he didn't kill me. I got to the top of the hill, got back on my bike and pumped my legs to get home. At this point, my house was less than 500 feet away. He turned his car around and followed me again. I got to my house, dropped my bike and screamed for my grandmother because she was the one home watching me while my parents were at work. The creep sped past my house and turned down a side street. I never saw him again. My parents called the police when they got home. I remember that the creep drove a Plymouth Duster type car, and he was balding and was about 25 or 30 years old. I don't know if he was ever caught, or if he ever hurt any children, his name, or anything. All I know is that I have never gone back to that library. It sounds silly, but it's true. And for the next few years, I walked and rode my bike constantly, looking over my shoulder. And now, I am unbelievably protective over my children. I don't trust anyone easily. I don't trust anyone with my children, and my first reaction to a helpful teacher or coach is what is his or her motive or true intention. Not a day goes by that I don't think about that day, and I wonder not, why me, but instead, why not me? My girlfriend was living with her mother at the time, and there was always this little kid from across the street who would just stand and stare at the house. One day her mom is going to get in the car to go to work, when the kid asks who the old guy is that lives with them, and why he never leaves the house. Her mom is pretty puzzled, and asks, What guy? She was divorced and there were no males living at the house. The kid looks up to the second story window, that he is always staring at, points and says, The guy who was always standing there staring out the window. Kind of scared, her mom replies that there is no guy that lives with them. She said the kid turned whiter than a sheet and just turned and ran. After that, it was like he did everything he could to avoid the house or even look at it. I was in Taiwan one year when I was younger, and had traveled to a busy night market. These are popular gatherings that usually operate in the evening. Nearby I spotted a sign for a net cafe in a five or six story tall building. Thinking I would fire off some quick emails, I walked into the dark small entrance of the building. The building was older and hadn't been well maintained. 
but it's not out of the ordinary in Taiwan. The entrance just had a dark hallway that led to a small elevator. I pressed the elevator call button and entered. The elevator was uncharacteristically new compared to the building, but I didn't think much of it. Like some Chinese buildings, there wasn't a fourth floor. It's considered bad luck, since four sounds like death. So it just read, one, two, three, five, six, which was usual. I looked for the floor the Net Cafe was at, the sixth floor, and pressed the button. It lurched into action quietly and began the ascend. When it stopped, I figured it was my floor, so I instinctively began to step out. Right before stepping out, however, the sight outside the elevator stopped me. It was pitch black, only lit by the light in the elevator. It looked like it hadn't been occupied for decades, with some random pieces of furniture covered with white cloth. It was a small building, so each floor were single occupancy, so I could see pretty much the entire floor from the elevator. Thinking I must have gotten the wrong floor, I checked the light, the one that indicates which floor you're on. Strangely, there was nothing. None of the indicators were on, but the floor button to the net cafe was still lit, so I knew that I hadn't gotten there yet. All this happened within a couple of seconds, and that's when I noticed a figure moving in the distance of the floor. It was not very visible, but I could make out what looked like a person dressed in some kind of gown moving slowly towards the elevator. I was thoroughly creeped out, so I started pressing the closed door button. As soon as I pressed it, the elevator light flickered off. I am this close to pissing my pants, and it's actually kind of freaking me out just thinking back to it. The lights flickered back on under a second, and the door closed. The elevator jolted back to life. A few moments later it opened again to the net cafe. I am beyond relieved at this point. I walked out immediately and sat down at a computer. After gathering my wits a bit, I walked over to the cashier's desk and told them what I saw. The girl working there listened, and her face turned white, so I asked her if she had heard anything similar. She told me that she had never experienced it herself, but some co-workers and occasional customers have brought it up. Basically, the building has six floors, and the fourth floor had a history. Apparently the floor used to be a hair salon of sorts, until one of the employees killed herself there for some reason. She slit her wrists over the hair wash station and died. The store continued operations despite stories of weird appearances. When customers got their hair rinsed, the water would look a little red, like the customer was bleeding. Things like that, and a couple of people reported seeing a figure walking away in the mirror. Naturally, the business closed down a few months later. The building owner tried to re-rent the place out, but never had any luck. Most businesses are quite superstitious, and no one wanted to rent the fourth floor after someone had died in it, even at a very cheap price. Finally, after dropping the price to nearly nothing, a stationary supply store wanted to rent. During the renovations of the floor, however, several accidents would happen. Tools would end up in strange places. A mirror from the previous business shattered when no one was around. And finally, a worker had his hand jammed between the elevator doors when it closed on him unexpectedly. The workers refused to continue working, and finally, the business left, and the building owner finally gave up and shut down the floor. He then had the elevator company come in to replace the panel so that the elevator could no longer go to the fourth floor. Let me repeat that. The elevator was programmed to never go to the fourth floor. It doesn't even have a button for that floor. But for some reason, 
Sometimes when people would take the elevator, it would take them to the fourth floor, and the doors would open, and some, like myself, would see a figure walking around in the dark. When I was a teenager, I was waiting at an abandoned mall in downtown Sacramento to meet a dealer to buy some pot. This was back in the day, so payphones were still functional and in pretty common use. As I was waiting, the payphone in the parking lot started to ring. Keep in mind, it was after dark on the outskirts of downtown, and not another single person was around. Out of curiosity, I walked over to the phone and picked it up. The man on the other line asked, Is this Pete? My name isn't Pete, and so I said no. The man ignored me and said, Pete, I want you to do something for me. I stated again that my name was not Pete. He ignored me again and then repeated, Pete, I need you to do something for me, or I will have to kill you. I laughed and told him again that I wasn't Pete. Finally, he said that he knew for sure that I was Pete and described to me what I looked like. He described me perfectly, down to the color of my pants and what type of hat I was wearing. I immediately hung up the phone and looked around. There was nobody, and I mean not a single person, anywhere. I got into my car and drove out of there as fast as I could. It was bizarre as hell. Someone was watching me from somewhere. Several months ago, my cat went missing in the woods, and I had to look for him. It was late at night, and the moon was a thin crescent, so the only source of light was my flashlight. I had seen my cat several times, but he seemed to be scared of something. Every time I got close, he would run further away. At a certain point, he got scared of something and ran back towards the house. I started to make my way back and saw a man. He was just standing there, absolutely still. He had black hair and a dark jacket on. I could make out all his facial features, except his eyes, where there just seemed to be a shadow. I called out to him, but he didn't respond. I then said, I can see you, you know, and was greeted with silence. I turned and walked a few steps, and then turned around. The man was a few feet closer. I turned, walked some more and then turned around again. This time, he was partially hidden behind a tree. I didn't need any more warning. I ran as fast as I could back to my house, where my cat was wanting to come in. I locked all the doors and sat on my sofa until I calmed down. Ever since that night, every few weeks, I hear a noise, late at night. It sounds like a rhythmic tapping on my window. There are no trees close to my house, and most of the nights that this has happened, it's not windy outside. Every time, I have been scared to look, probably for the better. The last thing that I want to see is that man standing there with no eyes. I live in Florida, and this incident happened about three weeks after Hurricane Irma, so not that long ago. Back in July, the ex and I had just finalized the divorce, 
and I moved into a gated neighborhood where every house was rented out by the same several rental company or landlords. It's a very small neighborhood with about 15 houses tops. All 15 houses are bordered around a man-made lake with the backyards facing the lake. No one really has a fenced backyard. When you walk out your back door, you see a lake in front of you and your neighbor's backyard on each side of you. Everyone in the neighborhood seemed very close. Someone was always hosting a family-friendly barbecue or having people over to watch sports. I was, or am, still depressed by my divorce. So, I never really partook in these social gatherings. The only person I got to know was my next door neighbor, Steve, an active Navy soldier with a huge love for guns. Steve is the true hero in this nightmare. My daughter, Alice, is four years old and I get her every weekend. Alice's bedroom window faces the backyard towards the lake. I spoil that girl to death. She truly is my everything, and I count down the days to the weekend every week just to be with her. That's why I was upset when Irma came and I had to go almost three weeks without seeing her. The weekend before the storm, she was with her mom. Then, obviously, the weekend of the storm, she was with her mom. Then, on top of that, the weekend after, she had to be with her mom because my power was still out. No AC in Florida is miserable. The humidity was so bad that week that I slept in my daughter's room the whole week because she had the only room with the window that faced the lake. I opened the window, exposing just the window screen, so the wind from the lake could come and cool my room as much as possible while I slept. Eventually, the power comes back and Alice starts visiting me again like normal. That was when the nightmare started. My daughter would complain about the singing lady and how she doesn't like her anymore. I thought maybe she was referring to one of my ex's friends or one of the teachers at her school. Maybe there was a teacher at her school that sang to the kids and she didn't like it. That Saturday night, Alice woke up in the middle of the night screaming bloody murder. I ran into her room and turned on the light and found her hiding under her covers. I asked her what was wrong, and all she could do was point to an empty corner of her room and say, Look! Look! There was nothing there. She was acting as if she saw a ghost. After I calmed her down, she started to talk about the singing lady again. Please tell the singing lady not to come back. Please, Daddy, make her go away. Obviously, she's having nightmares, right? I showed her there was nothing in the closet and nothing under the bed, and that there was nothing to be afraid of. She calmed down and went back to sleep. I went back to my room and quickly fell back asleep myself. I couldn't have been asleep more than 20 minutes before Alice comes running into my room screaming, She's back! She's back! Alice absolutely refused to go back to her room, so I let her sleep with me. The next morning, Sunday morning, I took Alice out to breakfast, and we stopped by Target to pick up a baby monitor. I haven't used one since her mom and I were married, but I wanted to easily be able to hear if or when she started having these nightmares again, so I could respond quicker. After I set them up, I showed Alice how they worked to give her assurance that I could hear her, she was safe. That night she slept soundly and didn't make a peep all night. The following weekend, Alice had to stay with her mother again because she caught a stomach virus from one of her little friends at school. It was Saturday night and I was sound asleep in my bed. Around 2 a.m., I heard it. A woman's voice humming a soft nursery rhyme through the baby monitor. The humming, soft singing got louder and clearer as the voice got closer to the monitor. I wasn't dreaming. I could hear a woman softly singing lullabies in my daughter's bedroom. I had never been so scared and dumbfounded in my life. I was feeling a mixture of pure terror and disbelief. Then the voice spoke out. Alice? Sweetie, are you awake? Adrenaline shot through my veins. I jumped out of bed and locked my bedroom door. I picked up my cell and called Steve from next door. He didn't waste a second. As soon as I got off the phone with him, I heard him storm out of his back door screaming, 
I ran outside and found him, aiming a shotgun at a woman crouched outside my daughter's window. The one I had left open after Irma and had never closed. Steve quickly dropped his guard when he recognized the woman. It was Jean, the neighborhood maintenance woman. Steve's wife came running out after him and confirmed it was her. Jean played dumb, said she was not singing, and didn't even know my daughter's name. She said she was near my daughter's window because she was doing her weekly patrol for gators and thought she saw one approach our house from the lake. I call bullshit. That bitch was singing, and she called out to my daughter by name. Yeah, it's true that there have been a few gator spottings around the neighborhood, and yes, part of Jean's job was to patrol the lake at night and every now and then, but at 2 a.m., I obviously knew this was BS, and even though neither Steve or his wife caught her out on it, I could tell from the look on their faces, they didn't believe it either. The next morning, I went over to Steve's house to thank him and tell him exactly what happened. He told me Jean and her husband had been known to be a little cuckoo, but this was by far the craziest thing that had ever happened. Steve helped me install metal bars on Alice's window that afternoon. We wanted to have a good time together, my girlfriend and I. You see, she's a nurse and has to work the night shift. The hospital she works at requires about five years of experience before you can even think about working on the day shift. This wouldn't be such a problem, but I work as a marketer. I have a typical 9 to 5 in an office and it's really tough finding time for each other. Our sleep schedules are chaotic, to say the least. So, when Valentine's Day rolled around on a day and night that we were both working, we got really frustrated. It's really hard to explain how you feel like you're being cheated at a time. Like, there isn't going to be a moment you can sit down and truly enjoy your relationship for what it is. But we decided that we weren't going to let our lame schedules get the best of us. We decided that we'd visit a city for a weekend, away. Valentine's Day fell on a Thursday, but we figured having a little trip that weekend would be the next best thing, maybe even better. She's been really adamant about visiting Oak Ridge in Tennessee. Her grandfather worked there back in the day, and it's always been an interest of her. She's always telling me these facts about how creepy it is and how she just has to go one day. It's roughly an eight-hour drive from where we live, so we made a deal about driving. I was going to drive the entire way there, and she was going to drive while we were actually in the city. She totally got a good deal of the bargain, but that's just what you do when you care for your girlfriend. But something strange happened. Something that has tainted my memory ever since then. When I think back and remember that weekend away, I'm not thinking about us cuddling up on the couch or any of the fun places we got to visit there either. We got there Friday night. She mostly slept in the car, but still felt really tired. She told me she'd be able to sleep at night once we got there and be awake and be normal for the next day. So that's just what we did. And it was a really good day. We got to visit a museum and learn all about the Manhattan Project. Even got to visit a plant where her grandfather used to work. At least, we're pretty sure it's the one he worked at. He's deceased now, so no real way of telling. But the tour guide said this was where the majority of them worked when the bombs were done. And well, I guess he worked on the bombs. Anyway, the day was great, but it didn't last very long. By the time it was dark, we were out of ideas for things to do and quite frankly out of energy. We decided to visit our favorite fast food joint, Wendy's. Don't judge us. And she was driving as we made our way there. It was only 10 or 15 minutes away from where we were. She had her music on and I was just kind of looking out the window. At one point, a blue Mustang was beside our car. We were stopped at a red light and I looked out the window and peered into theirs. I saw a very old man. He looked unhappy, miserable even. His skin looked unnaturally pale, but I'm not sure when he started, but he was staring at me. It wasn't until I looked into the car that I noticed it either. Not gonna lie, kinda freaked me out. We made eye contact for about five seconds, and then for the briefest of moments, he smiled. I was so fast. It must have been a split second that his mouth went into a smile and then back into a frown. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen. 
I looked over at my girlfriend, and she hadn't noticed at all. She was jamming out to Bohemian Rhapsody. The light turned green, and we were in motion again. I didn't take my eyes off that car for the rest of the ride. At least, until they turned. That's not the craziest part. You see, it gets even weirder. We were planning on leaving Monday morning, and on Sunday night, we went out to eat. But this time, to an actual restaurant. We weren't feeling fast food again. We looked on Google and found a local restaurant that had pretty decent reviews. I had my favorite food, deep fried chicken. So, off we went. I had completely forgotten about that strange man I saw in that car. But about halfway through my meal, I noticed him again. This time, though, he was in the restaurant. He was staring at me. I know he was. And when I noticed, he did the same exact facial movement. Just the way I remembered. He went from a miserable frown to a split-second smile. And then he was back to frowning in just an instant. I'm not entirely sure my reaction was warranted. He hadn't actually done anything wrong to me, and I was enjoying a nice meal with my girlfriend. This is why it was so strange for my fight-or-flight instinct to kick in. I went up and confronted him. He was sitting at a booth alone. I asked him why he was looking at me. To my absolute surprise, he never said a word. Just sat there and frowned at me. I asked him what his problem was before my girlfriend told me it was time, and we headed home. She knows I can get a little worked up and wanted to avoid some sort of confrontation. It's not illegal to look at people, she said. Still, though, it was something about that man that made me feel so strange, so watched. Well, Monday morning came. We were about an hour into the car ride, and she was asleep again. And you guessed it. You totally guessed it. I saw this freaky old man again. But this time, it was way worse. For starters, he was driving a totally different car. I don't know what this guy's life is like, but I can just imagine what you have to do to be able to afford a Mustang and still have enough money to have a second car. And to make matters even worse, he had been in the left lane as he was going to pass me. But he didn't. He just placed me for about a mile. I noticed that there was a car next to me. It wasn't until I looked over to flip the bird that I recognized him. It was a creepy old man, but he wasn't frowning anymore. That smile that he'd been able to muster for a split second was now permanently stained on his aged face. It was the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. Suddenly he turns his head forward and aggressively veers his car in my direction. Reflexively, I slam the brakes and swerve off to the side of the road. My girlfriend is shaken awake and all we can see is a vehicle speeding off in the distance through a cloud of dirt. My heart was racing like crazy, and by the time I could process my girlfriend screaming, asking what's going on, I started to feel myself choke up. We discussed whether or not we should waste our time calling the police, but I was so scared. The best possible course of action seemed to be just to get the hell out of that godforsaken town as fast as possible. The rest of the ride home happened without incident and I haven't seen him since. Needless to say, that was the least romantic and most insane Valentine's Day I have ever had. A bit of backstory before I begin. This happened in 2007 in upstate New York on Christmas night, around 8.30 p.m. The day was pleasant and festive, Opening presents early in the morning with my sisters. Hearty breakfast made by dad. Delicious smells from the kitchen as mom and dad prepared a feast. Visits from extended family bringing pies and cakes for dessert. Around two, we all sat down to eat and then lazed about for the rest of the afternoon into the evening. At about eight, after everyone had left and the food was all put away for round two the following day, I decided to head over to visit my friend in the next village. The drive would be about 10 minutes if I took the back roads to get there, so I did. First, a little background on where my friend lived. It was a housing development surrounding a private lake. You might call it a gated community. You could still drive through it freely after hours by entering one of four private entry points. Since the community was built around the lake, the road surrounding it went in a spiral sort of shape. The houses were sparsely positioned on the outermost part of the spiral road, closest to the four private entry points. As you drove in further, 
there were a lot more houses positioned closer together near the lake. My friend lived on the outer edge of this development, so once I reached the entry point, it would only take me another few minutes until I reached the house. His house, along with all the others, were far enough apart that you couldn't see them from the road as you were driving by. There were woods on either side of them, with long driveways and open fields. You could see porch lights in the distance, but that was about it. As I entered into the development, the speed limit dropped from 30 miles per hour down to 20. There were no street lights in the development, and for some reason, I never put my high beams on. I couldn't go any faster than the speed limit because there were speed bumps in every, like, 30 feet or so. It was a mild night. I remember having my driver's side window open slightly, taking in some fresh air. I remember driving in silence, which was unusual for me. I normally always listen to music when driving. I must have been enjoying the quietness after the commotion of the day. I reached a section of the road that had barren fields on either side and wood set to the back. Houses were probably nestled back into the trees. As I drove, I noticed what looked like someone walking up ahead on the opposite side of the road, coming in my direction. Mind you, I was still going about 20 miles per hour the whole time, so it was probably less than a minute by the time the walker came into clear view. I got a quick scan of it from my windshield before my car, and it was exactly parallel. This is what I saw. It was not a person. It stood on two long legs, with long arms hanging down from its shoulders. It was strong looking, lean, muscular, but not beefy in stature. It looked thin at the same time. It stood at least seven feet tall. It was light colored. I'm not sure whether it was white, tan, yellow, or grayish. It didn't appear to have fur, but there was some texture to the skin. It wasn't smooth. There appeared to be something coming down off of its back. I don't know what it was. All I can recall about its face is the small features it had, but the mouth and jaw were notably large. It had pointed things atop its head. Two things going straight upward with something mingled between the two things. That's what I got from a quick scan, and from my observation of it, as it neared my car and as my car neared it. As my car became parallel to it within a split second, I went from looking out my windshield to looking at it from my driver's side window. At that moment, its face quickly peered down at me, and all I remember was the mouth open wide. Out came a remarkable scream that I'll never forget. It gives me chills just thinking about it. It consisted of a high-pitched shrill shriek enveloped by a deep guttural growl. I kept driving all the while. This was all happening so fast that I didn't even have a chance to be scared or shocked or anything. I continued driving and continued past my friend's house and drove home. I called him to tell him what happened and I just needed to get back. I was probably running on adrenaline to get home. Later on, I was in total shock after it sunk in. Had my driver's side window been opened fully, it would have touched me, or worse, taken me. I'm certain of it. To this day, I still haven't worked out what this was. Has anyone else ever seen anything like this? I was in Tesco, a generic wholesale shop that we have here in England, and just innocently browsing the DVD section on my own. I was looking at the new releases, but not paying too much attention. My friend's parents were always away on holiday, and she was having a sleepover. Girls night at hers and had asked me to get a scary horror film for us to watch. Whilst looking, I heard, So you like movies, eh? I turned around and saw this guy who looked to be around 70 years old. He had greasy hair, but what struck me the most is that he was wearing socks and sandals. Yeah, that kind of made me smirk. I looked at him and just said, Yep, 
and proceeded to carry on down the aisle. He followed me and started talking about films that he'd seen, what I should get, etc. I just replied, yeah, okay, whatever, and was reaching the end of the aisle. I'm a girl, 23, but must have looked younger, as I didn't have that much makeup on, and I have dark brown long hair. This old guy was still following me, and asking me where I'm going, do I have a boyfriend, do I like oral, and if I am alone. That was it for me. I turned around, looked him dead in the eyes, and said, piss off you hillbilly pervert, and walked off into the shop. I had gotten some ice cream and some popcorn and was now in my car driving to my friends singing along, badly, to the radio. I'm not so sure how long it had been there, but I noticed a silver pickup taking the same turns as I was. I was only doing around 50 in a 70 area, and they could have easily have overtaken me if they'd wanted to, but it stayed right behind me, my friends turning past me, but I could take the next turning and double back on myself through the back roads. I didn't indicate, something I regret now and realised that this was very stupid of myself. I took the turning and drove as fast as I could to her house. And as I did, I saw the car take the same turning as me. She lives in a cul-de-sac area, and I parked my car down the road, not in front of hers, and ran into her garden. She always keeps the gate open, and I didn't know how long it would be before she'd have to open the main door, so I chose the garden. I locked the gate behind me, and knocked on the back door, after being let in and being called a weirdo and peeping Tom, I got handed some wine. Not a minute later, there was a knock on the door. My friend opened it. It was the creepy guy from Tesco, with his silver car in the middle of the road. He was standing there saying something along the lines of, his daughter's car had broken down, and she had rung up from a house along this street and he's here to pick her up. Is she here? He described me and what I was wearing. My friend said no, and shut the door in his face and locked it. I hadn't told them about the creepy guy, I'd only just got there. But she said there was something off about him, and wasn't my dad. No way I would have ever have known him. We saw through the curtain that he went to every other house in the cul-de-sac, he would get turned away, and then move on to the next one. We later found a piece of paper in a plastic sandwich bag left on my car windshield. It said, Where did you go? I wasn't finished with you. I used to live way out in the middle of nowhere, with my aunt and cousins for about five years. It can get pretty creepy at night. The town we were closest to only had a pre-K through. Twelve grade school, post office, church, a tag agency and notary. We lived about six or seven miles away, and we went to school there. Most of the homes are miles apart. We didn't even have bus stops. Each student was picked up from their house, and parents whose children rode the bus had to pay a fee for gas, because my bus rides lasted as long as three hours every day. That's how rural the area is, covered in woods and rivers, and there's a lot of wildlife. There had been a wildlife burning in a neighbouring county for the past couple of days, destroying acres of forest, forcing wildlife to flee. We had been extra cautious when driving, because deer were everywhere, and you couldn't drive long without seeing one. It wasn't uncommon to spot fellow motorists stranded after a deer incident. There was almost always blood-spattered trucks sitting at gas stations. My cousin and I were going home. We were using her truck to help a friend move a pool table, 
and we ended up staying and playing pool until a little before four. We hadn't been drinking or anything, just hanging out, and we were driving down this old dirt road. Over the trees and in the distance, we could see smoke from the burning wildfire against the night sky. A big buck ran out in front of us, causing my cousin to hit the brakes. Then something much bigger ran out after it and grabbed the deer. It happened so fast my eyes were locked on the buck and I didn't get a good look at whatever it was. We hit the arse end of it and whatever it was went spinning. The truck crashed into a small ditch on the side of the road sending dust everywhere. It wasn't serious and neither of us were hurt but it knocked the battery cables loose. We pulled out our cell phones, but of course no signal, and we weren't surprised. Neither of us mentioned. We were hit, and we got out and attempted to open the hood, but we couldn't reach the front to unlock it, because the front of the truck was wedged against dirt and sitting angled downhill. There wasn't much we could do, so we walked up the road searching for a signal and using our phones as flashlights. Then we saw the deer laying beside the road. It had been gutted. There was a huge ragged hole on its belly and its intestines were strung out for a few feet in the directions of the woods. This was a very large deer and we immediately decided that we weren't going to be a part of this. We got back in the truck and waited for a passing car. I rationalised that we must have hit the deer or something but she knew we didn't. We hit something else. We got lucky and after about only 10 minutes, we see some headlights. It could take hours for another car to pass. But on these back roads, as soon as they get close, we flagged down the driver and told him what happened. He told us that he was heading out for an early morning hunting trip. He wasn't in a rush and offered to try and pull out our truck and followed us showing a big dent he had from when he hit a deer a few days earlier, which started a conversation about all our wildlife animal refugees. We told him about the deer and asked him if he knew which kind of animal could do that and he decided to take a look. We walked him to where it was, but it wasn't in the same place and it wasn't a whole deer anymore. It had been ripped to shreds. Most of its bones were intact with strips of flesh still attached. It was a horrifying sight, mangled and bent in odd and unsettling ways. He said, holy shit, that's a 12 point buck. We asked if he thought a mountain lion could do that kind of damage in 10 minutes. And he just replied, maybe, very unconvincingly, and suggested giving us a ride home and coming back for the truck when it's light out. He gave us his number to help him pull the truck out later that day. But we had our uncles do it. We didn't want to bother him anymore. There was a bunch of black fur stuck to the grill but no blood. Our uncles brushed it off as an overreaction. But they never saw the deer. When I tell people this story, they're convinced it was a skinwalker. I was 10 years old and just started 5th grade. I had made a new friend in school, Janie. My parents allowed me to go for a sleepover at her house, even though they'd only met her mother once. And my mum and dad were pretty laid back because I was their last child and my sisters were 9 and 13 years older than me. So my mum dropped me off, said hello to Janie's mum and left. Me and Janie started playing karaoke when her mum decided that she was going to leave. She said goodbye to us, gave us kisses on the cheek and I remember that she smelled a bit like black licorice. Me and Janie were left to do whatever we wanted for the next five hours. Janie's older sister came home around 1am and told us that we should be going to bed because we were falling asleep on the couch and so 
we went into Janie's room and laid in her bed. Later that night, I can't be sure what time it was because it was pitch black, but Janie's mum came home. I woke up to a pounding sound on Janie's bedroom door. I started yelling in fear when I felt a hand cover my mouth. It was Janie telling me to be quiet and pretend to be asleep. But at that moment, it was too late. Her mother had kicked in the door. She stormed over to the bed and grabbed Janie's face. She began screaming at Janie because we accidentally left the TV on. I was trying to hide under the covers, but she saw me and she began slamming her fists on the bed around me and screamed, you think you're better than me? Over and over. I was sobbing and all I could think about was going home. I was so scared and I begged her mum to let me call my parents because I felt sick. Her mum though, grabbed my chin, looked me in the eyes and said, I know what you're doing little girl and you aren't going anywhere until I say you can. She stormed out of the room, slamming the half-broken bedroom door behind her. Janie said nothing, and neither did I. Needless to say, I did not sleep that night, and in the morning when I went to call my mother, Janie's mother was on the phone. She wouldn't let me use it even though I asked multiple times. And finally, when she was going to take a shower, I heard her pass the phone over to Janie's sister and said, Don't let that little bitch use this phone. If you do, I ain't buying you cigarettes anymore. I was a sheltered kid, and at the time I overheard that, I knew that I had to get out of there. I approached Janie's sister, and she basically threw the phone at me. She was ready to give it to me before I even asked for it, and with a look of fear in her eyes, she said, My mum is calling her guy, so you need to call home now. And so I did. She saved my life, and I still believe it to this day. Was her guy someone who was going to come and get rid of me? I shudder at the thought. The rest of the story isn't very exciting, my mother picked me up and I acted like nothing was wrong. Two days later though, it was parents day. Janie was in my class which meant her mother was there as well. Her mother approached me and asked me why I never wanted to come over anymore and she accused me of being a mean girl. She was talking to me in a way that seemed harmless, therefore wasn't obvious to my mum or teacher. I kept my mouth shut and didn't say a word. But two weeks later, my older sister was babysitting me whilst our parents were at the movies, and I broke down and told her what happened because I couldn't stop thinking about it. She comforted me and told my parents. We hugged each other and cried. A couple of weeks later, Janie stopped coming to school. My classmates wondered what happened, and so did I. I didn't want to ask my parents what happened. Fifteen years later, I heard from Janie on Facebook. There was no life-changing conversation, but we did exchange pleasantries. I suppose that's life sometimes. In the year 1972, my younger sister and I were forced to move from our home in Norway to go live in the UK. My mother had just married an Englishman who had four children of his own and they were expecting another one. It was a miserable time for me because at six years old I had not begun school yet in Norway so consequently I spoke no English. I had also been forced to leave my father and beloved grandparents behind 
and my own mother was more interested in her new husband than any of her children. My childhood was the unhappiest time of my life, and this was only exasperated by the experiences in the manor house in which we moved to. The old manor house was situated in a seaside town. From the outside, it was the picture postcard of the British countryside. A large lawn surrounding the driveway leading to the house. A glass greenhouse, stables around the back, and horses in the paddock. But behind this facade, we experienced such horrors some that I still struggle to talk about to this day. Us children all experienced paranormal activity, particularly at night, and it left us exhausted. Our parents were not particularly concerned and often shut us out. All we had were each other, and it was terrifying. You dreaded sleep and the activity that would come with it. I would sleep with my dog and cat on the bed, but even they could not bring me enough comfort. One night, when I was around nine years old, I was awoken by my dog standing near the bedroom window, growling. The cat was standing with her back arched and fur standing on end, hissing loudly. All of a sudden, though, my dog whimpered, and then suddenly, there was silence. The room went cold, and the darkness seemed to engulf us. I got out of my bed shaking in fear, and crept towards my bedroom window, where my dog was now crouching, ears pinned down to her head. The floorboards creaked under my weight. As I reached the blacked out curtains, I peeked out to see if there was an animal in the front yard that could have startled the cat or dog. But I saw nothing. I craned my neck and looked beyond the greenhouse. Again, there was nothing. I sighed. I took a step back and went to draw the curtain. But then, suddenly, everything happened at once. The dog started barking ferociously and frothing at the mouth, and my bedroom door swung open and slammed hard against the wall. My posters then flew off the walls. I turned back to the window and I saw the face of a man smiling menacingly at me. Terrified, I spun around expecting to see someone who stood behind me. But when I did, there was no one there. I turned back to the window, and it was gone. All that was left was the fog imprint from the outside of the window, as if someone had had their face pressed up against it and was looking in. My room was on the second floor and no one could have reached that far without a ladder. Since that day, I have never forgotten that face. But the activity continued. I would wake up nearly every morning with my posters littered all over the floor and would spend the first part of my day pinning them back up. It was relentless. My parents never believed me. But after months of torment, I refused to leave my mother's bed at night. It was then, when my stepfather was forced to sleep in my bedroom for a night, and only after he experienced it for himself, did he believe me. When he woke up in the morning, all of my posters were laying skewed on top of him. Despite all of this, there was one thing that did bring me comfort during my miserable childhood. I always missed my family in Norway dearly and cried myself to sleep most nights. But then one night, I felt a light touch brush beside my hair from my face. This simple and intimate action 
brought me so much comfort. I opened my eyes and saw an older woman sitting beside me. She had grey hair swept back into a tight bun, and now reflecting on the clothes that she wore, I suspect that she was once a maid or the head of the house. After all, this was a very old large manor house. She would visit me often, and always brought this feeling of familiarity and comfort. Although I knew that she wasn't alive like you or I, I did feel that she kept me safe from the man that I saw at my window. I was not the only child in that house to have a paranormal experience either. My younger sister Ella shared a room with our stepsister Marie, and she would awake nightly with fits of terror and sweat, and she would often come into my room and curl up in my bed, frightened with me. I only had a small single bed, and with a dog, cat, and now her kittens, it became too much to have her in my bed with me. So one night, when the usual routine of night terrors and her crawling into my bed had occurred, I told her to go to our mother's bed instead, insisting that I would take her there. I held her hand, and we left my room and went onto the landing. My mother and stepfather's room was at the very end of the hallway, and right next to it, there was a very large Victorian mirror. We could see our reflections as we crept along the corridor, and were careful not to wake up our sleeping siblings. Then suddenly, Ella stopped, frozen. I looked down at her and tugged her arm, unresponsive. She stared ahead at the mirror. My heart sank and I became overwhelmed with a feeling of dread. Slowly I looked up. There in the mirror, we saw the back of a maid pushing a service trolley. She was moving towards us. We belted back to my room and hid under the quilt. We heard the squeaking of wheels pass us and stop. We didn't dare to look, and we stayed there until morning. I will never forget these events. I grew up in a haunted house, but I'm not sure if it was me or the house that was haunted. I've had spooky shit happen to me my whole life. This is one of interest. I'm not here to prove that the supernatural exists. If you don't believe it, that's fine by me. But I know what I experienced. When I was a young child, I had an imaginary friend called Sally. She wore a white dress black shoes, and a red bow in her hair. She was white and had blonde hair in a ponytail that went down to her waist. We would only play in my basement, never outside, in a park, or upstairs in my home. As I got older, I forgot about her, and I figured that she was just a fragment of childhood imagination and didn't think about her until I was a teenager. My best friend and I were talking about our childhoods and eventually spoke of imaginary friends. I brought up Sally and to my surprise my bestie described her to a T. I asked her how she knew and she said Sally is in the corner. She's always in the same room as you. She doesn't like that I can see her, and is glaring at me. That gave me chills. Whenever my bestie was over from then on, I would ask her where Sally was. She would point to a corner, and, I shit you not, I would see a white flash in the spot she had been pointing. My ex-boyfriend 
told me that he would see a split image of a little girl glaring at him from corners if he entered a dark room alone. I was talking to my current boyfriend a couple of months ago about Sally, because he believes in the paranormal. When I described what she looked like, he got pale and told me that he too had seen her. According to him, he saw her in a closet one day. He opened the closet and right in front of his face was a pale blonde girl with a white dress and a red bow. Her eyes were pitch black pits and her mouth was agape with pointed teeth. Ice went down my spine after he told me that. I told him that my favourite place to hide as a child was that closet. I played a lot of hide and seek in that house, and no one ever found me in that spot. My boyfriend's childhood home is also haunted. If you look in the kitchen window at night, you can sometimes see a face looking at you in the second story window. His parents have both said they'd seen it. I've seen it too, and it scared the crap out of me. My boyfriend's house was haunted like I said. Here's an incident that happened at the time. He and I are weirdos, and fairly quickly into our relationship, we started discussing the paranormal. He said that, as a child, he would see figures running in the patch of trees behind his house. He told me about the face in the window and phantom footsteps that would walk around his house when he was home alone. I didn't doubt a word. One night after work, he picked me up to spend the night at his house. I worked really late, so it was around 1am-ish, and we hung out in his garage so that we wouldn't wake his parents up. After we went to bed, I realised that I had left my purse in the garage and stepped out to get it. At this point, I had seen the face in the window, so I was wary of his house at night. His garage is detached from the house, so I had to go outside. I have to fully step inside the garage to reach the light switch, and to my dismay, the lights barely turned on and only gave off half a flickering glow as they were old crappy tube lights. My heart was pounding as I walked into the depths of the half-lit garage. As soon as I grabbed my bag, the lights turned off and I heard the sounds of children laughter surrounding me. I booked it back inside and didn't even bother hitting the light switch. I told my boyfriend and we both didn't get much sleep that night and I have never been to that garage alone since. This other incident happened to me. When I was a kid, I had friends in the neighbourhood that I hung out with all the time. There was an old lady down the street that we called Granny Shay, and I would go visit Shay to swing on her tyre swing sometimes and play with her cats, crows and kittens. She always fed the strays and birds so they were friendly. Granny Shay loved me, but hated the other kids, as they were mean to her cats and ruined her garden. Granny Shay passed away when I was in high school, and her granddaughter rented a room in the house to one of my childhood friends. One of the boys that Shay had disliked so strongly. One night, the granddaughter was away and my friend had a small party at Shay's house. We were sitting in his room when he told us that Shay had died on the very bed that we were sitting on. Being teens, some of the guests started yelling at Shay, demanding that the spirit show herself, taunting her and saying she was dumb for dying and stupid and stuff like that. I got uncomfortable and stood up to leave. Before I got to the door, the lights in the room shut off and I was next to the switch and went to flip it when I felt that it was already in the on position. I turned the switch down and the lights came back on. They immediately turned off and I turned them on again. 
Then the lights rapidly started switching on and off, even though at this point I was no longer touching the switch. Some of the people in the room started yelling at me for messing with them, and the lights turned back on with a feeling of finality. On the wall above the bed was a black handprint that had not been there before. We yelled and ran out of that room, and I ran back home and never set foot in that house again. <laughs>